You heard it time and time again. If you want to be successful, you have to be consistent, right? It's like a broken record at this point, but consistency is such a broad term. You probably have thought, what exactly am I supposed to be consistent with doing? And I get it. As your best friend in beauty... I got you, okay? One of the things that I am known for is my consistency. I mean, the Friends and Beauty podcast is proof of that. I've been releasing episodes every single Wednesday for the last three years without missing a beat. So trust me, I got this consistency thing down packed. So if you've been struggling with being consistent, I'm doing something very special for you. On November 17th at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, I will be hosting Mastering the Art of Consistency. And I'm sharing all of my secrets on how I maintain my consistency and the 10 areas of consistency that I focused on that took me from being undiscovered to being a trailblazer. So I don't know if you know, I recently received the 2023 Black Beauty Roster Excellence AJ Crimson Trailblazer Award, and it made me reflect on what got me to this point. People were even sliding in my DMs asking for advice on what they should be doing to move the needle forward in their businesses. And I've been trying to figure out a way for so long to teach my friends in beauty how to be consistent and overcome their challenges with being inconsistent. And this is it. If you've been feeling like you're constantly overlooked for opportunities, maybe clients aren't rolling in fast enough for you, or maybe you get discouraged and find yourself starting and stopping, questioning your worth, or maybe you're just on the verge of burnout trying to keep up with all the girlies on Instagram. Does this sound familiar to you? Okay, like then you absolutely have to join me for mastering the art of consistency because I can almost guarantee you that the results that you want lie in being consistent in at least one of the 10 areas that I'm going to share with you or maybe all 10 of them. It may be just what you need to change the trajectory of your business going into the new year. I'm going to be sharing the 10 areas of consistency to focus on to become a trailblazer. The number one reason why most people struggle with consistency, strategies for developing consistent behaviors, and how to set yourself up for success and consistent behavior going forward, and so, so much more. So if you're ready to stop being stuck and actually do the work that matters to blaze your own trail in this industry, then register for Mastering the Art of Consistency. It's free, by the way, because I really want to help as many of my friends in beauty as possible with this information. So register right now. I'll leave the link down below. Share the link with your friends in beauty, your other friends in beauty that you want to see win as well. OK, don't keep this information for yourself. And let's set the industry on fire, like in a good way, though. OK, all right. I'll see you soon. Let's go ahead and jump into the episode. And so actually creating um, rules that in the majority of states in this country, it is legal to discriminate against a black person based on their hair. And so these, this is a methodology to deny people jobs and money, to deny education, housing. So it's a strategy of warfare. I like to think about a famous psychiatrist named France Renan, um, who, who's really focused on identity work. So he encourages people, he's now an ancestor, but encourages people to think about um, the answer to these questions often. Who am I? Am I who I say I am? Am I all I ought to be? Again, for COVID, we learned a lot, right? If you cough in and sneeze and do not leave your house. But if you're crying or having panic attacks, you're still expected to. Welcome to the Friends in Beauty podcast, a safe space for ambitious beauty industry creatives to have real talk, get authentic answers and practical tools to grow their businesses. Join me every week as me and my special guest reveal the keys to longevity and success in the beauty industry from the ups and downs of their journey to the nitty gritty of their struggles and triumphs. We're spilling the tea on it all and most importantly, having fun while doing it. You ready? Hey, what's up? It's your best friend in beauty, Aquia Robinson. Welcome back to another episode of the Friends in Beauty podcast. I am so happy to have you here, and I hope you're listening to this episode in high spirits and in good health. Now, on today's episode of the Friends in Beauty podcast, I welcome Dr. Afia to the Friends in Beauty guest chair. So Dr. Afia is a psychologist and hairstylist, and she is the global expert on Black Mental Health and Hair. So welcome to the Friends in Beauty podcast, Dr. Afia. 
Thank you for having me. I, that intro made me feel special. When you said global, you really emphasize that. So I appreciate it. <laughs> yes, global. You are reaching the masses all over the world. I'm so excited to connect with you because I, I saw that you were at the Black Beauty roster um, luncheon, but you, you already know how that went for me. So I didn't get to connect with everybody, but I'm so excited to connect with you today, though. Yeah, yeah. I love Black Beauty roster. I'm actually a consultant. So I think it's really smart of them to hire a psychologist to talk about black beauty so they have the the edge in doing their work i love that we could talk more about that in a little bit that is that is really cool i didn't know that you were the consultant i love that okay. that's how i got invited because i'm not any celebrity makeup artist like you all or hairstylist so I, I got to be in the room because of my my mental health techniques and research i love that i love <laughs> that for you that's awesome so let's start off with some icebreakers first to get us warmed up so the friends of beauty audience can get to know you outside of what you do professionally so the first one just give us three random facts about you oh wow okay i am from long island new york so the suburbs but it's still new york uh -huh. um i love to swim which I think is unique as a black woman in terms of I was like the captain of my swim team in high school and in college, I was a synchronized swimmer and was on the synchronized swimming team. Wow. Okay. Um, <laughs> and another fact, um, okay, I went to Howard for my PhD and graduated at 26 years old mm -hmm. with a PhD, which is kind of young because um, I hadn't lived life yet, but I sure knew psychology. <laughs> okay, I love that. I, wow, those are great, great random facts. <laughs> okay, so what is your favorite, your favorite international travel destination? Ooh, I think I'm biased towards two places. I really enjoyed South Africa okay. because of the culture, and I felt rich. the The U.S. dollar went really far when I went there, and so I felt like I could stay at the best hotels, eat at the best restaurants. So that was the wealthiest I ever felt. Okay. Unfortunately, you know, there all the international issues of the American dollar. I don't mm -hmm. want to go into that, but um, but my second favorite or in the running is Barbados. I think I'm biased towards that because that's where my grandmothers are from. And it's just a tiny little island, but great food, great community, island vibes. Okay. I love that. But I've always wanted to go to Crop Over. I've done yes, yes. Dead Carnival. I've done it like three times, but I always wanted oh. to go to Barbados. <laughs> Fancy. My, you saw my flag. My family's from Jamaica. Yes. Uh, yes Jamaicans I love that. Are, are very clear on where they're from. So I appreciate that. Very, and, very clear. And and they know they're from Ghana. And that's what I always appreciate about Ghanaian, well, Jamaican culture having connection to Ghanaian culture. So yeah. it's there from Kofi and Nanny and all the Akompon, like the Maroons. They they knew that they were warriors from Ghana. So I love the history. And when I went to Ghana, I went in 2017, I saw so many Jamaican flags over there. I was like, yes, I'm home. And it feels the same too. It feels the same. Exactly. I would, I definitely see those places as the same because I've been to, to um, Ghana just once, but it definitely gave Jamaica vibes. So I, I can see it's all relatives. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, I have these pod decks that have like these random questions in them, sometimes crazy. This oh. is a, would you rather and a what the heck? Which one would oh, you rather? Okay. You're making me nervous. I'm used to asking questions like this as the therapist, but okay, I'll, I'll be on this, the couch for the side. <laughs> Which one do you want? Uh, would I rather? Would you rather? Would okay. Rather. Cool. <laughs> Let's see. Ooh, no, I don't want to say that. Oh, God. <laughs> I don't even want to think about it. <laughs> would you rather accidentally laugh loudly at a funeral? or fart while giving a speech at a wedding <laughs> you know what I'm gonna go with the laugh I'm gonna go with the laugh because I am a laugher and so I could see that actually happening and I think I'd be able to process it that, that that's the release of my sadness or anxiety and it's just coming out as a laugh form. So I think I could rationalize it if it happened. Like that. You gotta, you gotta laugh sometimes. You know, you can't, you don't have to cry all the time at funerals. You could think of happy things that about yeah. the person that would make you laugh, you know. Exactly. And they be telling jokes at funerals too. Like I know I do at least, right? To have a range of feelings. So any feelings should be welcome at a funeral. How about that? I don't know if fart should be. Yeah. <laughs> at a wedding. <laughs> I don't know. We'll see. Somebody's probably done that anyway. 
<laughs> but um, <laughs> what do people always tell you that you're good at aside from what you do professionally? Hmm. So in the past week or so, I've been getting a lot of feedback about my um, improvisational skills, like in terms of telling jokes or storytelling. Um, I think that I just deal with so much stress personally and professionally that I've been transforming that energy into humor. Mm. So so I think that that's one of my future um, options to do some stand up. I need to take a class or something, but I, I'm open to the idea of, of telling jokes and storytelling yeah. um, as my my new skill. I like that. I like <laughs> that. So you could be a good host. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I like that. <laughs> when is the last time you did something for the first time? Ooh. <laughs> I like that question people always gotta think yeah I think let's go with this summer I think it was in August I took a class in Wim Hof method so Wim Hof method is basically a technique of uh focused breathing meditation and cold plunges so I had never taken an ice bath ever. Why would I, right? And yeah, so no. um, ended up doing this research on Wim Hof. And he says that you have to regulate your nervous system. And it has all these benefits for your health and anti-inflammatory. And so I remember thinking, like, am I really about to do this? I was the only Black woman in the whole course, of course, right? Who, who's going <laughs> to And so there was just this big old tub of ice and I'm like am I really about to do this and I remember feeling like nauseous before I went in like almost sick to my stomach like what what did I why am I paying this person to go into this really really freezing body of water but I went in and did my breathing and got super focused and it was amazing then I'm like I gotta do it again so I think this summer that so August um did something for the the last thing I did for the first time is that right okay yeah, yeah that, so that's, that's how you did it. something for the first time <laughs> okay so first of all I feel like all the black people saw a uh, ice bath and was like I was gonna sign up but no that's probably why <laughs> and then it kind of makes it, it makes sense though after what you just said about like controlling your breathing while you were in the ice because my best friend I was like acting as her doula for when she gave birth and I was watching some of the courses um, that they gave. And one of the techniques that they gave them for when they're getting having contractions is like to practice at home with your hand, like holding a piece of ice mm -hmm. and like focusing on like something else, like not focusing on the ice that's in your hand and it feeling cold, but to control your breathing and to think about like other things. And I, I had to do the exercise while I was watching the, um, the training. I was like, oh, because like at first it was like focus on the ice. And then when you focus on the ice, it was like you could really feel the ice. But the second time you focus on your breathing or something else, like you really couldn't feel. So that's how they said to practice for the contractions. It's like to focus on. You know. the, the the mind body connection is amazing. Like mm -hmm. we're still making new discoveries like every day on how it works. So, so, but imagine submerging then your whole body when you're in a bathing suit and sitting there for minutes at a time. Like it was a feeling that I won't forget and wasn't afraid to do again. So yeah. Mm -hmm. and that's the thing somebody else mentioned that to me before it was like once you, you realize that you can do that you feel like you can do a lot of other things that are hard or difficult exactly the ice was symbolic that's what the, the instructor mm -hmm. told us so we're, we're constantly confronting these things that are uncomfortable mm -hmm. but but focusing on on your why and um that you can make it through so it was super symbolic and therapeutic even for me so I'm a fan I love that <laughs> So the last one, if you weren't a psychologist and a hairstylist, is there anything else you could see yourself doing right now? Hmm. <laughs> I think I think I'd be into some sort of arts. At, um, maybe culinary arts, because I I really I really am into um food photography these days. Like I feel like when I take a picture of my food, it tastes better. <laughs> um, and so like I try to make these like art masterpieces with with my vegetables and things like that so may maybe there would be like some vegan chef raw chef thing okay. that I would pursue um yeah vegan? and a photographer of the food okay, you're <laughs> vegan I on and off I do identify 
as being mostly plant-based, mm-hmm. then I'll, I'll, I'll get into an occasional fish, especially when traveling. Cause you can't go yeah. to the place that I just named and be fully vegan there. You won't be eating anything. Right. So <laughs> I guess flexitarian when I travel. Okay. Okay. I love it. Well, thank you for the, the icebreakers. This was fun. <laughs> so I would love to know Dr. Fia, how is your mental health today? feeling good I have to admit I didn't sleep the best because I had a lot on my mind but I feel like my body is is grounded I don't feel distracted I feel generally pleasant in this Mm -hmm. moment um and I'm excited to have this conversation so I I, I'd I'd give myself a uh 90 percent okay I like that 90 (laughs) percent is still passing I like it it's an A. Yeah. Do people always <laughs> tense up when they find out you're a psychologist? Not always. Some people lean into it, right? That this is their shot. They got to shoot their shot. Tell me all their business and have me analyze them. Mm-hmm. Um, others are are saying, I've heard people tell their children, don't say so much around this woman. Oh, um, okay. she's going <laughs> to analyze, but but I think I think people are generally open to it and surprised, like, oh, psychology, let me find out. So I think the community has been pretty open to okay. that part of my identity. Okay. How long have you been in this field now? So if we, we date back to college, um, I took my first psychology class in college in 2000. So I'm, I'm tapping into tw- 23 years. Um, now of studying psychology. Okay. So I went to the University of Pennsylvania for undergrad, majored in psychology. Then I went to Howard for my master's and PhD. And they throw you into seeing clients right away, like your first semester, even though you don't even know what you're doing. Just oh, wow. Okay. There. So started seeing my first clients in 2004. So yeah. Oh, wow. Hey, I know you're enjoying the episode, but I need you to do something really, really important for me. Like right now, I need you to leave a five star review on Apple Podcasts and let the people know how much you love the Friends of Beauty podcast. See, in the podcast streets, I'm gonna let you know something. If you don't leave a review, then people don't know that the show exists and then the show won't grow. Reviews are so essential to the continued success of the Friends of Beauty podcast. And plus... I really just want to know what you think about the podcast. I appreciate all the DMs, but a five-star review would be even better. I would love to read your review on the show and give you a shout out for being a loyal listener. And if it's not a five-star review, don't even worry about it. All right, don't even worry. Just go ahead and send me an email, honey. We ain't got time for that. If you're watching me on YouTube, don't forget to subscribe, give this video a thumbs up, and even leave a comment to share a takeaway from something that you've learned so far. If you don't subscribe or give a thumbs up, then the YouTube streets don't know that the Friends of Beauty podcast exists either. You see how this is going? This is a group effort and I appreciate you so, so much. Okay, I'm done. I'm done. Let's go ahead and get back into the episode. 20 years of me doing this work, but at least I don't, I don't think I look, I don't have any makeup on, but. Right. You said 2004, <laughs> I just had a flash. That's, that's the year that I graduated from high school and my, my 20 year reunion is about to come up and I'm just like. What is happening? See, <laughs> I missed my reunion, my 23 um reunion because of COVID. So it would have been 2020. Yeah. Or 2020, so we didn't have it. But I'm gonna go to my college 20th reunion in May. Woo! Okay. The time be flying. I'm telling you. <laughs> oh my god. So for almost like 20 years, you've been doing psychology. And then when did hair come into the play? Come into play. Well, hair was actually first. I okay. always loved doing hair. I was my family's hairstylist. I would have a lawn chair set up at family cookouts and <laughs> would line my cousins up and they were all my clients. My aunties were my clients. And so um, that was my my early days. And then in college, I also would do hair. Um, I went to a school that was predominantly white so that when black students got together, we did things like hair and gossip mm-hmm. and things like that. So I, I had like a little salon in my dorm room, whether it was an athlete preparing for the big football game and I was giving them cornrows because remember it was 2000. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> and, or if it was somebody going to like a dance or on a date that I would do their hair, but I didn't charge. I I do not I did not charge for doing hair. I wasn't business minded because I just enjoyed the creative process of doing hair. So um, that came first. And so I went 
to get my PhD in psychology. And then I went um, back to hair school and ended up working at a natural hair studio in Silver Spring for a few. Oh, wow. Okay. That's so cool. I was supposed to do something with them uh, last week, but it didn't work out. But they're my favorite salon, Angela Walker. Um, Carissa, Tonya, I know Carissa. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Carissa went to um college together. Well, you went to UDC. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I worked at UDC for six years. What? So, yeah, mm-hmm. I was at UDC from 2004 to 2009. Okay, yeah, I was there 2015 to 2021 because they were playing games. <laughs> look I got out right when they raised the tuition like that last semester I was there is when they raised the tuition and I was like out of there because I paid for a uh, school out of pocket oh at the yeah. time. that's how cheap it was well, well good yeah because they they in UDC their branding they would say we're the most affordable university in DC mm-hmm. um but it's funny to think about how affordable can shift and change but I guess they are the most affordable yeah, I mean, <laughs> Right. That that's so cool. So you went to college. You got your master's. You got your you said your PhD. Mm-hmm. You went to cosmetology school. When did you get the the idea to combine the two and do psychotherapy? So that actually was in college as well. I remember talking to my aunt on the phone one day and telling her, I don't know if I should go on to hair school or if I should study psychology. And she said, Well, why can't you do both? I don't think she was telling me to do both at the same exact time, but that's the way I interpreted and thought, hmm, I can do hair and therapy together. So it was in my college dorm room that actually birthed that concept. That is so cool. So what exactly is psychotherapy? All right. So psychotherapy is using hair as an entry point into mental health care. So it's training hairstylists, barbers, makeup artists, um, skin experts, any beauty expert, um, how to use um, mental health first aid skills. And so it can also include having hairstylists um, collaborate with mental health professionals, um, having therapists come to the salon or barbershop space, having group therapy, individual therapy. It could even be connected to social media messaging to put you know information about depression as you're doing your makeup and things like that um and yeah it's it's a whole whole complex thing but just connecting beauty and mental health overall I like the idea that because we already are our people's therapists anyway but we have if we're equipped with some of the skills to be able to you know help them through it a little bit or direct them in you know to the right direction I like that idea Especially when it comes to the men, because I just sat in on this, um, I say like the barbershop talk, but they were talking about um, the overarching message was just about the changes the the Department of Education is making Mm -hmm. with like financial aid and stuff that will affect if barbers and cosmetologists will be able to continue to go to school Mm -hmm. and get that education if they can't afford it then and if they can't get financial aid. So they were, the guys were talking about how that's going to diminish the amount of barbers that come and, you know, get their, their license and everything and the amount of people that be available because the men use the barbershop as like a place for therapy. And I was like, I I was like, okay, okay. (laughs) Because I feel like it depends on what they're talking about in the barbershop too. Like, I can't be talking about well, women. We're not supposed to know. We're not supposed to know that they say the barbershop is a black man's country club. That's their safe space. Yeah. And so I don't know if we should always be included in, of course, to be able to advise and support, but um, they need their sacred and safe space as well. Yeah. But I actually argue in a lot of my research, because I have a few articles published on barbershops and mental health, mm-hmm. that I argue that men actually have more focus on hair than women do because <laughs> they have to, they have to get their hair done more frequently than us, especially if they're keeping it low, but in terms of beards and fades, that it's a much more frequent interaction with beauty professionals. We don't even think about beauty being something that's male or masculine, but it is. The other day after I looked up the word beauty because I'm like, I use it so much. I need to be clear on what the definition is. And it said um, something that pleases the intellect. Oh. It pleases the intellect. I don't, I wouldn't have associated that word with something about pleasing the intellect, but it's a feeling yeah. and a thought process, right? Beauty and a behavior, like feeling is a thought, feeling and beauty is a thought, feeling and behavior. And so just to even think that men and male identifying people can experience 
certain mm-hmm. thoughts, feelings, or behavior around pleasing their intellect. So I, I'm, I'm hoping we can broaden that concept a bit more. Yeah, I really feel like the psychotherapy would be great for the bar. I mean, for all of us, but the barbers in particular, because it was another event that I uh, sat in on or worked a couple of weeks ago where they were talking about safe spaces for men and how women, we more so have space safe spaces with each other because we could be more vulnerable and talk about the things that we're going through amongst women, but men don't necessarily um do the same thing. But I feel like if more barbers were equipped with these skills so that when the you know the men are coming to them and you know getting their hair cut, they can have these meaningful conversations and you know help each other through it. That's so great. Exactly. All right, you you understand it. Glad. Yes, I do. Because you know, as a makeup artist, people be spilling their, you know, their business to me. And I just be like, okay, girl, okay. You did what? <laughs> like, you know, just you know, the things like that. What kind of first aid um techniques or maybe like three of them that we can use when we're dealing with our clients? Okay. Well, I use different um acronyms, one of them being hair. Um, so H being harm to self or others. So there are ways that you can actually listen for suicidal thoughts or even self injury. Um, so for example, when someone talks about not looking forward to the future or hopelessness, or maybe they start giving things away, Uh maybe not as talkative, isolating, these actually could be signs and symptoms of thinking about suicide. And sometimes too, there's no sign at all. I want to be clear that we we may never know, but just to even pay attention to the changes. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I actually give stylists um, and barbers a script um, that they can sort of go through. It sounds like you're in a, you're really suffering right now or to even like acknowledge what's going on and to be curious about um, self-harm or suicidal thoughts Mm -hmm. Uh, also in terms of this mental health first aid the a for it stands for um active listening i think that that's one of the most important skill sets basically active listening is when you can show your receipts that you're actually listening to somebody and you can do that by rephrasing what they said and clarifying too because you might rephrase and to say did i get that right yeah. Or I heard this or I felt that. So you own that this is something that you heard or felt and put it, push it back towards the client to say, is that in my understanding? Um, things like that where where we can um recognize that something like depression can look a little bit different on black women yeah. than other people. So for example, depression for black women can be more associated with an attitude. Like they, they got a stank attitude, but it's actually they're suffering so greatly that they can't regulate their feelings when interacting with other people at times. Or even thinking about what their hair or skin looks like. If someone's hair is really matted and tangled, that actually can be a sign or symptom of depression because they didn't have the energy to take care of themselves or their skin's breaking out that that can be, you know, these levels of stress, especially at certain stress points in the face. Um, or even... If, you know, we're identifying a black woman as like lazy or tired, that that actually could be depression, right? If they're showing up late to appointments and things like that, it's like, I'm going to charge you all these extra fees. Actually, they may be struggling to even get up and take a shower. Yeah. Um. So kind of like paying attention to these things um, and how to get someone connected to a mental health professional. Yeah. Wow. This is, this is incredible. I had so many like light bulb moments as you were talking. Cause I did see on um, the psychotherapy page about hair mm-hmm. depression. And I never really, um, until you just broke it down just now, cause I have a friend that I'm like, she was probably definitely depressed because mm-hmm. I would just look at her as like, girl, get your hair done. And she doesn't know how to do her own hair. So I always just took it as like, you know, she gets her hair done and she doesn't know how to manage it. So I'm like, she was probably definitely just depressed mm. like, mm, and like knowing like she was depressed like now that I think about it where her hair was like that she was going through a lot but mm-hmm. like, and I want to be clear too that depression isn't like something bad or good it's just how our body reacts to real to loss to stress yeah. um, depression is considered the common cold of mental illness meaning at some point in everyone's life even your life and my life we're likely to experience it and so just even be clear that it's a reaction to what's going on 
Yeah, yeah. So just being more understanding as beauty professionals that like, I think a lot of times we take things personally, like she showed up late, she messing with my time, like, uh, uh, uh. but just being a little bit more empathetic, I guess, mm-hmm. to understand that, you know, people could be going through things and to even get to that appointment was a lot. Wow. That's, that's mm-hmm. interesting. Have you seen any like major, major links between mental health and just like the beauty industry as a whole, just like the standards that we're supposed to up- you know, uphold as people, human beings. <laughs> mm, mm. Yeah, the the standard is unrealistic, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> there was something in my research lab we used to say unrealistic advertised norms. I think sometimes what happens in the beauty industry for makeup and hair in particular, all the filters and the time lapses that don't actually show the full process, that don't allow for texture in the skin. And then there's this sort of... Um, disappointment that can happen when we're not achieving a certain look Mm -hmm. and so I think it can become quite stressful when you have a certain image in your head of how you want to look versus how you actually do that that can be triggering for um distress that we don't always process and talk about I think you know mental health is more trendy now than it used to be right I think just even since the pandemic I've never been so popular like no people just contact me I'm like me like you want to talk about mental health But I think that people are coming to terms with how much stress and pressure has been created in this industry, Mm -hmm. that now it's safer to actually talk about that stress and pressure. pressure. So I'm grateful, but also disappointed that it took this long for for people to to voice it. But um, yeah, the the pace, the the keeping up with trends, the expense of Mm -hmm. things, um, super challenging. Yeah, yeah. And when you said that about just like the filters and the unrealistic expectations, I had this client like years ago and it was two different friends. One, they would both come to get their makeup done. And one of them asked me like, how come my makeup doesn't look like, you know, hers? And I had to explain to her like, well, you have textured skin. Like her skin is like, like a baby's butt. Your skin <laughs> is like a little bit more texture. So like, it's not going to lay, you know, the same and you know, like the appearance of it is going to look different. But when when you're so used to seeing edited photos online or people using filters and stuff like that, you don't realize that that person may have textured skin as well, but they, they're using the filter to like smooth it out. So, oh gosh, this this world that we live in, I can get exhausted sometimes. It's like... <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I know, I know that capitalism plays a role, right? In terms yeah. of creating this very hard to achieve look and... Uh, selling products so that you can look like your favorite celebrity, but mm-hmm. uh, systems. <laughs> yeah, is it anything that can be done when people don't have that, when their appearance is not lining up with the way that they want it to be perceived? Is there something that they can do about that? Yeah, well, I think that therapy can be very helpful in terms of understanding their identity. Um, like therapy, I'm using loosely in terms of this collaborative process of change. But um, I like to think about a famous psychiatrist named France Fernand, um, who who's really focused on identity work. Mm-hmm. So he encourages people, he's now an ancestor, but encourages people to think about um, the answer to these questions often. Who am I? Am I who I say I am? Am I all I ought to be? Again, who am I? Am I who I say I am? Am I all I ought to be? And so it really puts you into a position of self-definition and alignment and congruence. And basically you become the standard in evaluating who you are and why you want to be that person and what are some of the barriers or challenges um, in, in how you're showing up versus who you want to be. And to be mindful that, again, others don't define it, but you do. Yeah, yeah, I like that. I, um, I really had to think about those things and you know what doing like video like surprisingly like doing videos content like doing YouTube doing the podcast and stuff like that has really helped me to see myself because I for a long time I struggled with like do I really act like this or am I just acting like this in front of like people but I'm like oh no I do act like that <laughs> Like when I watch myself back, I'm like, oh, that is like you're you're being yourself. But for a long time, I couldn't tell if I was being like authentic mm-hmm. or if it was just like my media, you know, my social media presence or whatever. But when I look back at things, I'm like, okay, I am that. And I'm, I'm so like, we're all layered too. So like you may pre- 
portray one way this in front of this group of people this group of people but it's all still me at the end of the day so yeah I like that you you're evaluating yourself I think that that's healthy and appropriate to question right and to understand why we show up in the ways that we do Mm -hmm. for example I'm someone who laughs and smiles a lot but it also makes me think why do I do that am I trying to get people to like me or am I trying to be Mm non-threatening or um you know just to be clear about some of the origins for how I show up Uh, publicly versus privately hey I have a serious question for you you trust me right yes I heard you say yes right you heard them say yes right okay listen if you said yes and you have a product or service-based business that you want to expose to a loyal and engaged audience then consider letting me share your business here on the friends of beauty podcast studies have shown that podcast listeners tend to trust the host making the advertising messages more authentic and credible and my favorite part which a lot of people don't know is the longevity Unlike traditional ads that have a limited lifespan and disappear after your budget has been exhausted, my podcast episodes are available indefinitely. This means that your ad will continue to reach new listeners long after the initial episode airs. And you already know my consistency is off the chain. I'm not going anywhere anytime soon. And as the Friends of Beauty podcast continues to grow, your brand will continue to reach a new audience. That's how it works here. So don't wait any longer. I want to expose your brand to my Friends of Beauty. All you have to do is click the link below with all of the details and we can make it happen. Anyways, let's go ahead and get back to the episode. Yeah, I'm like, I smell. I mean, that's just how I I look. (laughs) This is like a gift of the curse. I tell people all the time because when I'm upset, I have to really like concentrate on like relaxing my my face. So I'm not like still smiling if people think that I'm happy. But yeah, it's that's a whole nother conversation anyway. But I would love to know more about just the, I don't know if it's just in the US or if it's a global thing when it comes to the Crown Act. I know you had a hand in, in the Crown Act. So can you tell us what the Crown, I know what the Crown Act is, but for people who don't know, what is the Crown Act and how were you able to, um, what role did you play in that? Okay, great question. So the Crown Act stands for creating a respectful and open world for natural hair. And so this was something that was proposed, first proposed in 2019 by Senator Holly Mitchell in California. Um, And on July 3rd, 2019, California was the first state to pass the Crown Act, an act that can protect natural hair, such as twists, locks, braids, bantu knots, um, styles that are a part of our culture and uh, styles that were um, positioning Black people to get fired from their jobs um, without consequence or denied access to school or even housing. Yeah. And so my research from that research lab um, was actually helpful to inform um, legislation in the sense that I was able to provide my research and even testify, I think in seven or eight states about the psychological consequences of hair discrimination for black people. Mm -hmm. And so I had one particular article that stands out called Don't Get It Twisted, um, that talks about hair discrimination within black communities. And so that was a primary source to inform um, my testimony and, um, various state specific bills around hate discrimination you are a writer you be knocking out these articles like like a champ <laughs> yeah and this was before ai oh um, <laughs> so i'm just even thinking of it i really had to teach myself how to do this because when i was in graduate school and i would tell my professors like i'm gonna do hair and do research on hair they would just look at me blank like what are you talking about and I realized that I had to create a sub-discipline of psychology around hair specific research for people to um, see my topic as legitimate and as science Mm -hmm. so I really made it a mission to write all these different articles with a lot of students from UDC and Howard in particular Mm -hmm. um, to be able to become experts on the topic as well. Yeah, I know someone here who was affected by that. And I think, I think, I know she was speaking about the Crown Act. So I'm, I don't know if she collaborated with them some kind of way, but her daughter had gotten uh, faux locks, like the oh, actual yeah. like lock extension, like it looked like locks. Her and her daughter were rocking it for a while. 
And then they told her that she couldn't come to school with her hair like that. And I was like, at an African centered school, I know exactly what you're talking about. And that's, and that's really strange to me because me and that girl, we grew up together in the same community. So I went to all African centered mm -hmm. private schools growing up, up until where did you go? I went to Ujima first oh. and then I went to Nation House. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I love Baba Ajay. Yeah, see, see mm -hmm. I, knew, I knew you was, I knew you was a part of the community. So kind of way. <laughs> I knew it. I had a feeling. I uh, love Baba Ajay. Know all the kids in the family. Yeah, um, he, he yeah, gave me a great handshake. <laughs> I have to show this to somebody that knows because that little, your arm just be <laughs> shaking all over the place. Oh, I miss Baba Ajay. But yeah, like just going to those schools growing up, I I realized as an adult, I don't know when I started to realize this. It was I know it's within my makeup journey that I grew up totally different from like a lot of people because the problem, not the problem, the challenges and the the stress that comes with a lot of black women in their hair, like I didn't, didn't go through that because of the schools that I went to. Like I was always in, taught to embrace my natural hair. Going mm. to a place with my natural hair was never a problem. So when I when I'm as an adult now, when I'm hearing things like the Crown Act and like it's like so heartbreaking to me. Um, just to I just never could understand how the way that somebody's hair grows out of their scalp naturally can affect them in the world. Like yeah. it's just well, that that's white supremacy, right? In terms of thinking about the majority of people on the planet Earth have hair like ours, right? And so that this is a methodology of containing blackness, of melanin, of these different things. And so actually creating um, rules that in the majority of states in this country, it is legal to discriminate against a black person based on their hair. And so these, this is a methodology to deny people jobs and money, to mm -hmm. deny education, housing. So it's a strategy of warfare. Mm -hmm. Right now, I feel like my tone is changing because we're bringing up Baba Ajay, but to really think about this re-Africanization process, that it's a threat for somebody to have locks or a fro or a twist or bantu knots, right? When we even think about the word bantu knots, this, um, we, you know, it's quick to know the style, but we don't know as much about bantu people, right? The majority of people on the African continent in terms of ethnicity, well, second largest ethnic group on the African continent would be considered Bantu people. So Bantu people share a particular language, cultural system, family structures, and the majority of those who were enslaved in North America, the Caribbean and South America come from the Bantu people. So that is actually our origin. Um, and so although we might not remember that our hair never forgets, right? Mm -hmm. I like to say that Africa always comes back every four to six to eight weeks, depending on the new growth. Africa always comes back. There is nothing you can do to change your DNA or your ancestry. And so that it becomes a threat to a system of white supremacy and racism um, when people embrace who they actually are, that they are Africans. And so you see how the tone changed now? Yes. No, oh. <laughs> but to think about how important um, this conversation is in terms of identity and health overall. Uh you you said it all and you know what I always wonder or now that I have you is like is there a link between mental health and the way people choose to wear their hair because like no shade like I just these are just thoughts that I have that I've never really been able to like express like fully but like I just always think about again no shade to people who wear weaves or whatever like if that's how you want to wear your hair then that's how you wear your hair but I, I'm concerned about the people who wear their hair like that because they're trying to cover up. Not because they, you know, that's their fashion sense or mm -hmm. that's the way they prefer, but because they're trying to cover up something else. Because I always think that like, what I, you know, I want to talk to a white person about this one day because I'd be wondering like, do they look at people who have like straight weaves crazy, just like how we would look at a white person if they had an Afro. Mm. Like if, if white people were walking around with like textured hair and like twist outs and stuff, will we be looking at them like, girl, like we know that ain't your hair. So I'll be wondering if they look at us the same way, mm -hmm. but is there like a link between mental health and like the way people choose to wear their hair? Absolutely. Absolutely. Side note, I'm, I just started picturing Rachel Dola's all of it. She got so much hate because she had braids and she did have like 
faux locks and stuff like that. Um, <laughs> it's crazy when it comes to that though. Yeah, but so I definitely believe that hair is a complex language system. Mm -hmm. And I think that your hair can tell how old you are, maybe what part of the DMV you're from. It can tell um, what maybe career you're in and things like that. It can reveal part. And we're talk, we talk with our hair that our brains literally register information from top down. So we look at hair and then scan um, the face and then the rest of the body. And so I think that we make intentional decisions. There is um, an article on hair presentation, the choices that Black women in particular make around expressing their identity through their hair. And even I had a research student at Howard, her, her whole dissertation was on racial identity and hair choices. Mm -hmm. and so she was trying to make a link between your level of blackness um, and how you were hair, your hair. There wasn't a strong link actually um, in some of the populations for people who chemically relax the hair versus mm -hmm. keep it natural. But um, this is, you know, we're communicating uh, whether it's our conformity or uniqueness through our hairstyling choices. And I think um, hair is the most, easily manipulated part of our bodies right That's we can change true. our hair every day if we wanted to but you can't change your skin color every day you can't change the thickness of your lips or nose every day you can't change your waist or thighs every day and so because hair is the most easily manipulated it gets manipulated the most mm -hmm. that this is the way that people choose to express themselves and whether they're feeling sad or excited or even if they're feeling proud or sh feeling shame about their culture, they can express that through their hair as well. I love that. Oh my gosh. Have you come into any challenges with doing this this type of, like this type of work? Of course. Um, <laughs> I think people are still trying to understand it. I'm always, I'm always shocked that hair care is not included in um, your health insurance, right? Um, I, I think I'm like why why do why do eyes teeth and hair are they not included in your your um your health insurance so mm -hmm. it, it, it makes me think about how I'm still on this journey of showing that this is a legitimate science or thing to study and so while I like the uniqueness of my work it's so few people looking into this topic that it can be a bit isolating yeah. um, from other professionals, but I feel like the community embraces it a lot. So I appreciate mm -hmm. that, that people, the community gets it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, just looking for funding. Yeah. <laughs> it's insurance companies aren't covering it, but to think about companies that align with the values of health and beauty and mental health. Mm -hmm. um, so still searching for more of those connections. Okay. And I also wonder too, when, even with the, like you said, mental health is like a really trendy topic. Can Do you think that eventually mental health can become a crutch in the sense that like, this is what I always tell people who have children. Like if somebody, if you're dating someone that has children or you have a friend that has a child and they say like, oh, my child is sick. I can't come. You can't be like, hey, F that child. Still come out, man. Like I'm trying to, we, we had plans. I feel like mental health will become like one of those things too, where people are going to start saying, oh, my mental health, I can't, you know, do this. Do you think it's going to be like that? It could, it could. I was even having this conversation with a friend the other day, the other day to say, can mental health become selfish? Mm -hmm. But I'm like, but if you're really not feeling well, why do people expect you to show up? Yeah. I think I'm still doing that dance, right? If for COVID, we learned a lot, right? If you cough in and sneeze and do not leave your house, but if you're crying or having panic attacks, you're still expected to. Mm -hmm. And so to even think about how we can be much more forgiving and offer more grace with these sort of invisible um, health concerns that are coming up in people's lives. Because if they actually tend to their health, that things could have a more positive impact for everyone. But I think we're still figuring out how that works, right? Mm -hmm. um, in terms of like mainstream, that that there's trendiness take care of your mental health but what does that actually mean mm -hmm. it can mean drinking a certain amount of water every day it could mean um getting those fruits and vegetables and it could mean sleeping seven to nine hours a night it could mean exercising four to five days a week that's mental health yeah like all those things making sure that your body has a the minimum um requirements at least to be able to function those same things that I described in terms of water, eating healthy, exercise, and sleeping 
um, are great ways to manage stress, Mm -hmm. but also impacts your skin and your hair growth. So just, but I think we're just not taking care of ourselves, period. And so if people put time and energy and didn't show up and didn't go to the cookout because they needed to sleep, I think that's Mm -hmm. fine. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I just wonder if people are going to start using it when they're not even going through mental health stuff. Oh, yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> like, girl, I can't come. My mental health. Like, I just saw you twerking on Instagram. Cut it out. Hey, that could be for mental health. I know I just started seeing a new therapist and she said I don't twerk enough. So <laughs> maybe that is that is an intervention right there. Love that. So yeah. Dr. Thea, like, what do you want your legacy to be with this work that you're doing? Even the research that you've been mm-hmm. um able to do, like, and how it's going to contribute to the globe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would love to create global community around um, care. I feel like, you know, the way that the healthcare system is set up globally, there's one person who looks at your teeth and there's one person who looks at your stomach and one person who looks at your foot. I want us to all become competent in the language of mental health and healing, to know all the terms, to empathize with people, to uh, be curious and gentle um, so that uh, we feel better. Yeah. Feel better so so that you can feel safe in different spaces to be your most authentic self. Mm-hmm. So I think that's that's the larger goal. And I, I like every hairstylist, barber, makeup artist, skincare expert, na- nail tech to know um, this mental health first aid. I want that to be core to the training and to the language of the work because there's tremendous emotional labor that folks are going through, but not necessarily trained in. And so to make sure that I can fill those gaps yeah. um, between like the skill set of um, the beauty work, but also the emotional um, and mental load of doing this work. Yeah, I love that so much. Is there anything coming up next for you? And I know you also like, okay, anything coming up next? Yes, to share. And also (laughs) how we can like get a part of this this training that you do too. Yes, yes, yes. So um, I have a huge event in Boston called Black and Beautiful in Boston. It's November 4th. We'll see whether or not the show airs before then, but it's going to be amazing between um, Maude Okra, who's the founder of Black Beauty Roster is coming, or Kia Neal, who created Texture versus Race, which is a DEI educational program, or Angela of N Natural Hair Studio, um, Dr. Shonda, who's a clinical psychologist and cosmetologist, um, Kier Gaines, famous, famous UDC alumni, who um, is a therapist now that chats with Oprah and Kamala Harris, wow. um, to Piff Marti, who's a hip hop artist who raps about hair and mental health, um, or one of my colleagues, Dr. Evan August, who's a professor at UMass Boston and works with my private practice, my psychological services. Ew-hoo, all these different people, Grammy nominated artists. And with that, um, I still continually have a monthly course to get certified in psychotherapy so people can actually get certified, whether you're a hair care professional, makeup artist, or otherwise a teacher, a photographer, a doctor, a lawyer, whoever. If you have an interest between beauty and mental health, you are welcome to get certified in this. So it's every month and you can check out that information on my website, psychotherapy.org, or on my Instagram at psychotherapy. I love that. Oh, this has been such a great conversation. I don't even want to let you go. I know you got stuff to do. I know ah, this is, we got to continue this conversation one day though. But before I let you go, let me ask you the friends and beauty rapid fire questions. Okay. So whatever comes to your mind, you can just spit it out. If you need to elaborate, you can, you're going to be great at this. So the first one is what are the top three keys to your success so far? Reading, journaling, and being kind to my community. I love that. How do you measure your success, Dr. Fia? Mm, based on my happiness. I like that. Yeah. Okay. What's the best advice you've ever received or a piece of advice that's always stuck with you? Mm. I think one of the best pieces of advice I got from an elder to really understand language because creating like a shared understanding is a key to connection so being very intentional about words and what they mean yeah yeah okay 
what advice would you give to another beauty pro right now who is just struggling with their business and they're just like, mm, I, I, I'm going to just give up and get me a nine to five for the rest of my life? <laughs> well, I would encourage them to uh, curate community in terms of reaching out on social media, shoot your shot to your favorite influencer or something like that in terms of getting um, support. I don't think that we can engage in beauty and isolation. And so to be able to um, establish a network and problem solve together. Yeah, I like that. Okay. <laughs> What's a resource that helps you or has helped you in your business that you can share with the friends and beauty community? Ooh, I think one of my favorite books um, that's related to beauty is Sacred Woman by Queen of Fuwa in terms of recognizing how much health is connected to beauty. I think there's an African proverb that says, um, health is beauty's sister or something like that, um, that gets into seeing that those things go well together in the book Sacred Woman. There's a whole gateway that focuses on how to um, feel beautiful by taking care of yourself. Okay, I'm gonna have to whip that book back out. I got that mm -hmm. book. <laughs> whip it back mm -hmm. out. All right, so the last one, I just want you to fill in the blank for me and just say, My name is, you know, Dr. Fia. And the key to longevity and success is whatever you think it is. Okay, my name is Dr. Fia, and the key to longevity and success is to align your consciousness with your destiny. So there's a saying, Ori e re it's all about alignment yes I love that yes okay okay so before you go share all your information again like your social media however you want people to connect with you and psychotherapy okay great so um I'm on Instagram and um uh, my handle there is at Dr. Afia D-R underscore A-F-I-Y-A and um, psychotherapies is at psychotherapy. You're going to have to put that in the caption because it's a lot of letters. But psychotherapy and the website is psychotherapy.org. I also am a full time therapist and have um, a private practice called Mayat Psychological Services. And so Mayat is a deity of um, truth, justice, balance, order, reciprocity, um, which are keys to mental health using a traditional African framework. And so I take clients and I have other therapists as well in that practice. Like, do you take clients in DC? Yes. So I'm licensed in DC. And so that's one of my primary locations. Yes. Okay. okay. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. We learned so much. I know I learned so much. And I'm going to for the Friends of Beauty community too. Say so we learned so much today. And we look forward to seeing everything that you continue to do. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I enjoyed myself. You're welcome. <laughs> Thanks for listening to the Friends in Beauty podcast. Don't forget, sharing is caring. If you enjoyed this episode, share it with another friend in beauty. Give it a thumbs up and subscribe. Rate and leave a five-star review so that other friends in beauty can find the show. Plus, we'd love to hear your feedback. Connect with us on all social media platforms at Friends in Beauty. Hashtag Friends in Beauty to join the conversation and join our Friends in Beauty Facebook community to stay connected. Talk to you soon.